Hello! Today I would like to talk about the male gaze. This is a phrase that I have heard used a lot very incorrect lately, especially like on like TikTok. Um, you know, words have specific meanings and those can change and evolve over time, culturally speaking, which is totally fine. However, the male gaze, I think, in its original intention, uh, still has meaning today that we should understand and be cognizant of. And I very specifically want to talk about this in a way that hopefully everyone can understand. I want to break this down in layman's terms. So my intention here is to give like a brief history lesson um, and talk about the origin of the term, the male gaze. I'm going to throw up an image real quick and I'm going to break it down really fast. It's going to seem ridiculous, but then I'm going to go back and explain more in depth the terminology as well as some other contextualizations. And then I'm going to throw the image up again, hopefully now with everything um, making more sense so that, again, hopefully everyone can understand what the male gaze um, means and why, again, hopefully it's still important today. The male gaze is a phrase that was coined in an essay written by Laura Mulvey, a British feminist film critique. It The essay is entitled, what is it called? Um, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. I believe it was written in 73 and published in 1975 because you'll alternately see those two years going back and forth depending on where you're looking. So I'm pretty sure she wrote it and then published it a little later. Um, it's broken down into to a couple different sections. The introduction wherein Laura Mulvey describes the framework she's going to utilize to discuss what um, she's going to be talking about. Uh, she utilized psychoanalytic. <laughs> she utilized psychoanalytic theory, which was very common in the seventies. Um, psychoanalysis is another term that is often very incorrectly misused. It does not mean you are analyzing someone through psychology. It's not what it means. Psychoanalysis is very specifically referring to something Freud came up with. Sigmund Freud, the grandfather of psychology. And it talks about like the subconscious and dreams and the ego and id and all that stuff. Um, it's not something that's really utilized in psychology today. Again, it is just a predecessor to what psychology is now, modern psychology. Um, it's outdated. But in 73, it was not outdated. <laughs> and if you're unaware, particularly when it pertains to writing in academia, um, you, you use a framework to talk about whatever you're going to discuss. So she used psychoanalytic theory, which would have been all the rage in the 70s. Um, how that pertains to feminist theory is it would assert that men have a psychological compulsion to oppress women because women lack. Lack is a very specific term. It's a capital L. It is, it describes something very, again, specific. Um, so women don't have a penis, which makes men uh, afraid of in which is called castration anxiety. It's not literal. It's all psychological and emotional. Um, and it's all, I think, personally, BS and dumb and why women got so on board with that, particularly feminists and scholars. I don't understand, but that's what people were doing in the 70s. Cocaine's a hell of a drug, I guess. So anyway, she's going to use psychoanalytic theory as well as she's going to be discussing um, phallocentrism, which is, you might be able to tell, phallo, phallic central, focused. So basically she's describing how the world is male biased and the arts included. Right, moving forward. The second section is pleasure in looking and fascination with the human form. Here she talks about scopophilia. Uh, scopophilia, very specific term, again, Freudian term. Uh, it's basically voyeurism. Like, if, if you're reading the word and then you're reading up the definition for voyeur, I could see you might not be able to distinguish the difference between these things. They're very, very, very similar. But scopophilia um, is basic. well, I'll talk about it later. Um, she's also talking about Jacques Lacan's mirror phase. Lacan also very heavily into psychoanalysis, like Freud. Um, the mirror phase would describe wherein an infant can look in a mirror and recognize that they're looking at themselves rather than something else. Um, if you have a dog, you know, like dogs will see their reflection and think it's another dog. 
um, humans will realize they're looking at themselves and that usually starts between six to 18 months. Um, but she, Laura Mulvey describes this um, in relating and identifying with a character on screen. So it's the, I don't know why she's using that, but all right, I think it's, good. I think it's digging, but whatever. Moving forward. The third section is women as image and man as bearer of the look. Um, this is where she describes the male gaze and I'll throw up the paragraph. So in a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy on the female figure, which is styled accordingly. In their traditional exhibitionist role, women are simultaneously looked at and displayed with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact so that they can be said to connote to be looked at ness. Women displayed as sexual objects is the leitmotif of erotic spectacle. So this is where she describes the male gaze. Um, she describes how men are active lookers and women are passive objects being looked at. She describes this as to be looked at ness. And she goes further into how people identify with characters on screen, particularly males identifying with the main male protagonist, which particularly in the 70s, back when we were getting into like between like the late 40s, but definitely in the 50s, 60s and 70s, we had what would be known as like machoism film, whereas women really took a back seat to the main male protagonist. And then lastly, she has her summary, which is the fourth section. And this is, I think, where we get the most important description, and that is there are three different looks associated with cinema, that of the camera as it records the pro-filmic event, that of the audience as it watches the final product, and that of the characters at each other within the screen illusion. And that's basically what I'm describing here in this image. Um, we have someone filming an event for a film, so you have a director, generally writers and directors and cinematographers are all male. That is not always the case, obviously, um, but particularly like cinematographers are almost exclusively male. Um, directors, we're getting more females, but still overwhelmingly male. Um, people who direct, you know, five or more movies, almost exclusively male. And then writers are where women get a chance to be more involved. Also, television is a place where females get to be more involved behind the screens, but particularly as it pertains to film, but obviously this includes television. Most of these roles are still masculine. Um, so we have the director who's male, he's an active looker, and he's in the role of a, a voyeur. Um, we have the audience watching the movie, which the target audience starting after the 40s was generally considered to be male. People, studios considered when they were making movies that they were making them for a male audience. Um, and that's not, like, that's a fact. You can look this up. But, like, even recently, there have been people who said, yeah, we had to change the movie because it didn't play well for a group of 14-year-old boys. So the studio made us change the end or whatever. Um, that still happens today. Um, general, so the audience is assumed to be male. They are active lookers and they would be in a situation of scopophilia. Again, I'll describe that later. Then we have the on-screen characters, and I just chose to use the um, Hitchcock film Vertigo. So we have the main male protagonist, who's the active looker, and the mirror for the audience to relate to, to identify with. And then we have the female character, who's passive, to be looked at, and objectified. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and kind of go through some important points and things I found in other people's definition of the male gaze, which might be useful. So what is meant by the male gaze? The male gaze describes a way of portraying and looking at women that empowers men while sexualizing and dehumanizing women. The male gaze suggests that female viewers must experience the narrative secondarily by identification with the male, which is why representation is so important. And that kind of goes back to what Lacan was saying with, um, well, not what he was saying, but what Laura Mulvey was saying through Lacan's mirror stage. I'll get back to that. Um, visual media that responds to the masculine voyeurism tends to sexualize women for the male viewer. The male gaze can be defined as the power to look, which is traditionally held by the dominant gender. 
In fact, most of the time, the female gaze does not involve sex. The male gaze is not just about how men view women, but also about how they create female characters. Again, back to representation, and they dehumanize them. Go figure. Especially in the 70s and, and 60s when Laura Mulvey would have been watching films. Um, so to go back to Lacan's mirror stage, as I discussed earlier, this is like when babies can look in a mirror and identify they're seeing their own reflection rather than like another baby, I guess. <laughs> um, and this, how Laura Mulvey is using it, is she's explaining how people identify with um, generally the main character. So it's uh, the spectator projects his look onto that of his like, his on-screen surrogate. So women generally are kind of forced to identify with the main male character rather than whoever the main male character is lusting after. Um, which is again, why representation matters. I'll probably circle back around to that. Um, scopophilia is kind of voyeuristic, as I said earlier. So scopophilia refers to the pleasure of looking as well as the pleasure of being looked at. It therefore has both voyeuristic and exhibitionistic um, and narcissistic overtones. So Mulvey refers to scopophilia as the pleasure involved in looking at other people's bodies, um, particularly in an erotic way, as objects without being seen either by those on screen or by other members of the audience. So this is scopophilia refers to how people in the audience view the movie. I wanted to also talk about um, the target audience, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so like by the 1970s, the industry, film industry, had decided that the target audience was male. Um, and honestly, that is held true to the 21st century. Um, largely, studios do kind of look at movies being made for men or they look at studios being made for men or women rather than let's make a movie for people who like the movie. Um, there really is a very big divide in, in the demographic and how we view the gender within the demographic in terms of making films. It's kind of ridiculous. Moving on. Also, I thought this was an interesting quote. Culture is saturated with male bias that women almost never have a chance to see themselves culturally through their own eyes. A mode of understanding literature, which could also be used for film, which can ignore the private lives of half the human race is not incomplete. It is distorted through and through. So by men, particularly in the 70s when Laura Mulvey wrote this, but even to today, being the primary people who write, direct, and film films, um, we have a very distorted view of women on screen because they're not actually women. Like even if they're played by a woman, they're written by a man. I think it was interesting the film Get Out. Obviously this is talking about not in differences in sex or gender, but in race, but that we have these white people who are trying to infiltrate, kind of, <laughs> not explaining this well, infiltrate um, black bodies. And if you think about how many black directors and writers and cinematographers and stuff there are, not many, unfortunately. I mean, you can name them, but compared to white people, not many. So generally speaking, when you have a black man on screen, he's not written or filmed by a black man. So you're not getting an authentic experience. You might be getting an authentic male experience because it's still a man, but you're not getting an authentic black experience because it's written by a white man. So it's this kind of like puppeting thing as it pertains to anyone who isn't a cishet white man on screen. It's, there's a the disingenuousness to it. Disingenuousness? There's a lack of authenticity and um, lived experience. I can make sense sometimes, but usually not. And with all that, I want to go around to the female gaze because I've also been hearing a lot about this and this is where it gets a little complicated. So this is all not a hard science. You can't put up a theory and say two plus two equals four and then check in, out your math and come to the conclusion that yes, two and two equals four. This is valid. We accept two plus two equals four. Gravity exists. You can drop an apple, it falls to the ground. 
you can you have your theory you tested it out it's proven true these this whole thing um the male gaze is is sociology i mean i know she's using psychoanalysis which is psychology but it's sociology it should be sociology sociology right there it's anthropology you know these are observations and you observe it and you can come back conclusively that yes this makes sense you can find quantifiable evidence outside of this and use that as proof like we can say men make more movies than women and we can go and look up because there are a finite amount of movies given it's a lot of movies but there are a finite amount of movies and we can see this many movies are made by men, this many movies are made by women, and the number made by women is much smaller than the number made by men. You can you can provide quantifiable evidence. You can provide qualifiable evidence by saying we've watched 100 movies um, from the 60s, like I'm sure Laura Mulvey did, and we've noticed a pattern in the coding of women, how women are portrayed on screen. There is a language to film you can learn that language and you begin to understand the tropes and you begin to understand what is being signified by certain looks and certain dress codes and actual language like um slang and stuff like that you know if which year is it like if you see a woman on screen wearing pants in the 40s that was coded for something right if in the 80s and 90s you see a man with an earring in his left ear, right ear, well, one of the ears, that was a code for something. They don't have to come out and say anything. There's a code. You can look and if you know, you know, uh, because you know the code, right? All right. So as it pertains to the female gaze, again, this is just, it's not opinion, it's observation. So you can agree or disagree, but it basically comes down to um, can a, can a gay person be straight phobic, right? Can a black man be racist to a white man in America? Can a woman be, um, mis, misan, I can't think of the word. Can, can, is misan, misandrony real, right? Like, can a woman be sexist towards a man in America? Okay. Um, and, and, I come down on no for all those. And how the female gaze works is we're talking about power dynamic in, in terms of the male gaze. So do women have that dynamic? Well, no, they don't. So if you concur that no, they don't, then the obvious answer is the female gaze doesn't exist. But even in terms of film, if you want to talk about it exclusively in that arena, I still come down on no. So as we were talking about, well, actually, I'll talk about the photo, all right? So we know that there's a three-way look. So one of the looks is the audience. Again, engaging in scopophilia slash voyeurism. Um, they're identifying with the main male protagonists. Um, they're considered to be male by the people making the movie. They made it for boys and men. And they're active lookers. Laura Mulvey specifically and explicitly said that men are active lookers and women are passive lookers. This doesn't change regardless of anything. Women are passive, men are active. She did specifically say male figure cannot bear the burden of sexual objectification. So men cannot be the bearer of the look. So the female gaze cannot exist unless it's towards another female. We'll get to that. <laughs> so the audience, um, for the female gaze to exist, the audience would need to have been considered to be female. Um, you need to have a main female character. But then again, it gets tricky because women are passive. They are not active lookers, so they are not going to engage in scopophilia. So question mark on that. And then the second one, we have the camera. Uh, again, it's it's voyeur. Shouldn't put a scope to feel it. That was a mistake. Meant to put voyeur. Um, it's male biased because men generally make movies and they're active lookers. Again, that gets complicated. The movie would have had to have been made by women with no male over on seers like producers or whatever. They would have the woman would have had to have the final say in all the matters. Um, which if you get into like indie films, that could be the case. Um, 
But again, women can't be active lookers, according to Mulvey. But let's just assert that they can be active lookers. Okay, we'll, we'll go with that. So again, we just need to have the main character needs to be a woman and it needs to be made by women. Okay, we can get this. But then we get to the characters. Um, so again, female protagonist who women are watching the movie as the audience identifying with her. But again, we get a hold of, of can women be active lookers? And there is science that questions this. We know that um, women can be as turned on by pornography as men can be. We do know this. However, we also know that even straight women prefer to look at women's bodies over men's. So even then, it does back up and re like these studies do back back up and reinforce what M Laura Mulvey was saying, which is the male body cannot bear the burden of objectification and male bodies do not have to be looked at ness. Um, and I think that goes back to, you know, we're kind of trained to look and be sexually stimulated by female bodies rather than male bodies. Kind of. Um, so yeah, power dynamics. So I come down on no, the female gaze is, is not something that can exist because of the patriarchy, because of phallocentrism, because of male bias. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and throw up that picture I threw up at the beginning back up. So now you can see kind of hopefully this makes sense wherein we have a three-way look in terms of film as Laura Mulvey described it. That is that of the director, again, with male bias. It's overwhelmingly films are made by men. And he is has warrioristic intention as he's making a movie likely for a male audience. And all the characters have likely been written by men. So there's a lack of representation and identification that women as audience members can experience. As it pertains to audience members, I've already kind of discussed, male likely, they're active lookers, and they're engaging in scopophilia. They're getting, um, you know, gratification through identifying with their like image, their on-screen surrogate, and objectifying the woman, which the on-screen character, the main male protagonist, is also likely objectifying the female character, the passive woman, the objectified woman who has to be looked at in this due to the lack of representation on her part. That about sums it up. Basically, to get it really oversimplified, the male gaze is uh, movies are largely made by men, for men, and objectify women. There you go. The male gaze. Hopefully that made sense and you learned something. Yeah. <laughs>